Right, so today's um, lecture, like I said, is about acoustics. And obviously acoustics is the science of, and physics of how sound gets propagated, how information gets carried in sound. It's more than that. But that's why we're talking about it here, because it's at the, S, it's at the core of, um, of um, sound and music. So actually, uh, acoustics covers the study of waves, and waves can occur in many different kinds of media. It's actually the same mathematics as electromagnetic waves. Um, and uh, so acoustics, although primarily you think about sound traveling through the air, a gas, it uh, behaves very much the same in a liquid. And so that's underwater acoustics as this big. Uh, Professional organization, which the Acoustical Society of America, they have these big meetings where lots of papers and like, you know, it's all these people doing submarine tracking and all these people doing like, you know, speech perception in the same, in the same organization. The cool thing about waves is that although there's this medium, this gas, the, the particles move around but they don't displace. I mean, like, like a solid, right? So you can have waves propagating in the solid. And uh, clearly, when you knock one side of the solid, everything stays where it is. But the, the acoustic wave, the sound wave, travels through, and that can actually deliver energy somewhere else in the solid. That's, um, that's what sound is doing. Um, and the, the most intuitive thing to think about is this, this thing we've all seen. Where, like, if you have a long rope, if you snap one end of the rope, make a little pulse and the pulse will move down the rope. The rope itself doesn't, it moves locally but it doesn't have a permanent displacement. But something gets transmitted and a little bit of energy here that can do some work when it gets to the end or it's carrying information from, from here to there. And that's the, uh, that's the, that's basically the essential, essentially the same as what's happening in all these other media. So what, um, What's actually going on? How do we explain what's going on? It turns out this, this situation is not that hard to analyze. <coughs> you can basically break it up into ele elemental pieces, thinking about, little, thinking about a little bit of the rope. And what happens is the rope um, then has this, some tension in the rope with forces going to the forces pulling this way and forces pulling that way. And then if the rope is uh, twisted slightly, it's curved, those forces are not in balance, and so then the elemental piece of the rope experiences some force and acceleration, and then the shape of the rope changes, and so then the forces change, essentially, it all uh, flattens out. So basically, the rope is subject to some local differential equations, and this is, you end up with this differential equation, which is that the the second derivative of the, this, you know, the offset of the rope on the y-axis, the d2y by dx squared, that's the curvature of the rope. So this x is y. So dx dy would be the slope of the rope. And d2, sorry, d2y dy dx would be the slope. d2y dx squared is the curvature of the slope. And so the curvature of the slope um, gives you the, it's, it's proportional to the lateral acceleration of the, of the rope. So if the rope is curved, then it's experiencing some acceleration. I guess if it's curved this way, it's experiencing acceleration this way. If it's curved this way, it's experiencing acceleration this way. All right, so you get the second order differential equation, the d2y d, dx squared times some constant is equal to d2y dt squared. I don't go through the elemental So we end up with this differential equation, and then it's like, well, that this is you know when you hand over to the to the mathematicians, it's like, okay, well, what, what am I going to get if I have a system which is governed by this uh, differential equation? What what does it do? And it turns out, well, um, you're going to have some displacement of the row y of x, right? Which is how where, what the how displacement of the rope is at any point x. And it's going to vary with time. So I have y of x of t, and that's going to be our complete description of what the rope is doing. Shape of the rope at any given time. 
and then this is a thing that's going to be subject to a differential equation. But it turns out all the solutions are going to be like this. They're going to be, uh, they're going to, it's going to be composed of two functions, y plus and y minus, which are basically arbitrary functions. It can be anything, although you probably want it to be continuous because you want the rope to not have this continuity thing. But they're going to be functions of a single variable, x minus ct, and this one is x plus ct. What happens is that y plus and y minus are fixed constant shapes. But the actual um, wave shape, the rope shape at any time, is chunks taking out these functions at two different places, and the places depend on time. Right? So it's, well, it's, uh, it's like it's a little, the shape of the rope is copied from y plus, but y plus centered around ct, and then y minus centered around minus ct. So we have these two functions, we pull the two different parts together. We add them up and make this the shape of the rope, and then as time moves, the places we can pull them from. And so these, this is basically a traveling wave. This is called traveling wave um, solution, because y plus and y minus, they're, they're these shapes, but they move, they travel with time, and they move in opposite directions, which is what we call y plus and y minus. So you have this sort of net rope shape, net one-dimensional displacement, and it's got these two components, one which is not changing the shape, it's moving this way and moving this way. So hopefully you can see the, the mathematical setup there. Um, so let me um, show you a a, a, an animation simulation of that, because that's obviously the right way to understand something described that way. So to do this, um, I wrote a little, little piece of code in processing to basically simulate this. It's, we're not going to look at this in any great detail, but there's not very much to it. Um, basically, I've got a couple of arrays for the y plus and the y minus, the two wave shapes. And um, Sorry. It, it's sort of right. So this is like, you know, it, this is updating these waves. Once every step, it just shifts these things over by one way or the other way, and then it has to generate new values at the ends. Um, but let's just let me show you this running, and you'll sort of see what's going on. OK, so this is like blue, which you can hardly <coughs> see. One y plus, the red is y minus, and white is the sum of the two of them. And then in this function, you can, uh, in this program, you can set up the white as a particular thing and then a particular shape. It's like, and so it's like you're taking a string and you're displacing it. And then what happens is it divides that equally between y plus and y minus. But then when you let go, it does the traveling wave thing. So here you can see the red wave is moving constantly one way, the blue wave, which you can't see, is moving the other way. And then when you add them up, that new I guess blue. No, I do actually have the source code right here, so I guess I can. Uh, where am I plotting it as blue? This is always, so this is RGB, so if I just make these larger, 128, 128, like that. So I'm now making it kind of blue with a lot of white added in. That's, the, yeah, you can see that now. So you see, you have, so this is not completely obvious, right? Let me, let me, uh, the, this thing, I can actually change, make this a very sharp plug like this. And now you can see that, okay, we just have these uh, pulses going each way. Because once they get to the end, something happens to sort of, you know, because we're looking at a different point of white bottom and minus. But you can see that there are these pulses moving in each direction. And then the actual what happens on the string is the superposition of those two. Right? So you end 
end up with this, these two parties moving off their direction, which is like, okay, that's a legitimate solution to why it's set up, but is that really what happens in the string? It seems a little bit unlikely. But um, it actually is. I can't stop this, can I? So um, what's interesting in here is you know, you've got this pulse coming in, and it sort of falls off the edge. But here, we're assuming the string is fixed. This point in the string can't move. And so that's what happens when, when the pulse hits the edge. You get this sort of complementary part coming in the incoming part of the traveling leg, which sort of manages to keep this part of the string fixed. And so that's how these are the boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions allow the physics to solve the problem of well, what's going to be on these traveling wave paths that we haven't seen yet. So that's what I look, you know, that's that's what's going on. We've got these two pulses moving in opposite directions, and then they sort of reflect at each end. In this case, they have inverting reflections because they because of this need to make the things sum to zero at the ends, and they just carry on like this indefinitely. If we had a you know more like a traditional pulse, it's this. A plug. It's the same thing going on, but now you have this funny thing where the resultant on the string is they, they sort of, you know, the, the uh, you know, sort of they have this kind of weird thresholding effect going on. If you pluck it off center, but like that, um, it's sort of like this, this kink that moves backwards and forwards, travels backwards and forwards up and down the string. So that's like, well, okay, that's not exactly, that's not what we imagine. When you think about a string being plucked, you think of it, you know, this nice bowing sine, sine wave going up and down. But um, it turns out that that really is, this really is a reasonable description of what goes on. So there's, there was this, there's this, there's a show, Time Warp, where they just use these like 10,000 frames per second cameras to shoot things. And so even at 10,000 frames per second or whatever, um, most strings are kind of moving faster than that, right? But, well, I guess not. But you want, you want to be able to see the thing moving along, and the, the time scales for music for sounds are like milliseconds. And so they have to use, they're using a bass guitar, so it's a very low note, it's like, you know, maybe 100 hertz or less. But at that frequency, and with this angle, you know, where they're looking right down the string, you can, um, you can actually see this thing going on. So this is. It's plucking it, and you can see, you know, it goes up and down. It rapidly, it depends on the, uh, on the mixture of modes, right? That, um, you actually, it, it becomes this mixture of different, basically, Fourier modes, and so only the high frequency ones are ones that give you the, the, the um, displacement that you can see. Okay. We don't need to see him anymore. But you can actually uh, see the traveling way in these pictures. You can sort of see it's moving up and down, which is, you know, exactly what, uh, what the math said, what the physics said should be happening. Okay, so um, the, this, well, this, that was actually kind of basically the plucked string, but it turns out that you get the same thing happening in a lot of, in any kind of one-dimensional waveguide uh, situation. So a string is like, the, you know, a guitar string or a piano is the same thing, it's a long string, harp, but if you have a long tube with air inside it, it actually acts the same way. The air uh, is an acoustic medium, will carry a pressure displacement. If it's in the tube, then it's basically one dimensional. So basically, the, you can put a pressure pulse in at one end and propagate down. And then the ends of the tubes become analogous to the, the, the fixed ends of the string. Although now you have the option between a closed end and an open end, which actually give you either inverting or non-inverting reflections. So all the wind instruments and the brass instruments are all based on this principle that you know, rather than having a string that's plucked and that's oscillating, uh, you have a tube, an air column, which is now, but you still get reflections even though it's open at one end, 
that impedance mismatch causes a reflection, and then the length of that tube is how long it takes that pulse to get down and come back. It gives you the period of the um, oscillation. And you can even have it in a solid. So a xylophone or a glockenspiel is a solid bar, and again, it's the you can understand what's happening in terms of the um, oscillation that bar as pressure waves being reflected up and down. The length of that bar is why the xylophone bars get longer as they go down the frequency. Um, so obviously we're talking we're interested in this aspect of acoustics because we're talking about music, and music is carried by pitch, by individual notes, which are oscillations that score, and here's the Fourier transform of, of performance, the spectrogram of the performance of that score on the piano, and what we see is these notes here correspond to these sets of harmonics, and it's playing particular pitches, so this is, what this was, C, C, it's not like a C, but it's like a, a G. C in the middle would be like 520 hertz, so this G should be, well, I don't think the frequency is quite right, but basically you can, you can make that analogy that there's a fundamental here, and these are all the different harmonics of it, so it's actually fundamental in the same note two octaves higher, which is what we're seeing here, C, D, E, F, G, yeah. So I'm seeing this, this fourth harmonic is looking extra dark, you see the note two octaves higher, which is four times the frequency, it's being struck on the piano at the same time. But, okay, so if the goal is to produce these somewhat stationary pitches under, under the control of the performer, there are a bunch of different ways we can do it. One very simple way to get a periodic um, oscillation is a simple harmonic oscillator. That is a system like this, where you have a spring and a mass, and then you know, the energy gets converted between the potential energy in the spring and the kinetic energy in the mass, and you get a sine wave, a sine wave oscillation. And that's actually how a tuning fork works. And the tuning fork, the spring is the springiness of the, of the bar, and the mass is the, you know, the effective mass of, of the bar itself, waving back and forwards. And so when they build a tuning fork, they take these metal, and then they drill out a little bit of the, the metal to, to adjust the mass until they get exactly the note that you want to have. And it's, it's pretty stable in temperature because the mass doesn't change it as it gets hotter and colder. And the constant of the metal doesn't change much. It's only the size that changes, it doesn't change very much. However, this is not a great musical oscillator because it only, it's a simple harmonic motion, so you only get the fundamental, you only get a coast line. That's why you get a very pure tone from a, from a tuning fork, but it's not a very interesting tone. So. Also, the only, and you have to put all the energy in the beginning, right? You hit it once, and then it starts shaking, and the energy dies away, but that means that the amount of energy that can come out at any particular time is quite limited. So it's not, there might be, you might want to have oscillators where you can control or you can continue to feed energy in so you can get sustained notes. So um, another, the, the most familiar way that we produce music is with our voices. And so that's, there's an oscillator involved there. The oscillator there is the, the vocal chords, which is a pair of muscles in your throat sitting on top of your lungs. And they basically, when the muscles tense up, they pull together and they, they seal off the lungs. And as you relax them, they can open up a little and the air can come out. Now the way this turns into an oscillator is that um, you, you, you push your lungs from your diaphragm, which generates some positive air pressure inside below this, below this seal. When you relax, these muscles until um, there's just enough, you know, they're just loose enough that the, the air pressure underneath is enough to push them apart, so sort of to let some air through. And then it leaks through, but then what happens is the pressure behind goes down because the air is no longer, you know, there's not so much air in being compressed in this volume in the lungs. And so then the force can maybe some other stuff going on, but as a, as a, the, the force that's pushing these muscles apart becomes less, and they snap back together. And then the whole thing goes over again, so it sort of opens up a little bit and snaps back together, pushes apart, snaps back together. And this becomes
becomes this uh, periodic oscillation. Um, you're constantly putting energy in, but it's pushing air, but, but keeping on pushing into the geothermal, you can keep sustaining the energy in it, so you have air, I guess. And you can control what's happening by the muscle control by controlling the potential of muscles. So it's actually quite nice in terms of you know, being at an oscillator you can control. But it doesn't have this resonance thing. It doesn't have like this long, you know, the period of it doesn't depend on, you know, some uh, pulse running down a fixed length and coming back. But, so it's not a very stable oscillator. And again, that's, that's why you have to be a trained singer to be able to sing a very pure note, because it's not intrinsically going to be a very uh, fixed frequency. You know, the small change in the oscillation here will change the overall pressure of the overall uh, oscillation frequency. So that brings us to the, uh, the string, the wave equation. Here we've got a thing where the frequency is very stable. The frequency is basically, you know, you've got this periodic thing, you saw the wave shape of that simulation would change its shape and repeat periodically. But the, but the period of that oscillation depends on the physics of this. So it's basically how long it takes the pulse to get all the way around these up and down the string, and that depends on the, um, the length of the string, obviously, and the speed of sound, how, how quickly a pulse propagates, which is actually the constant, the C squared constant in the differential equation, and uh, depends on the mass of the string and the tension of the string. And so here's the equation of frequency. Omega squared is proportional to the tension S, and inversely proportional to the length squared and the mass of the So we can change the frequency by changing the length of the string, which is the fretting on a violin or a, a, a guitar. And we can also change the behavior of the string by changing the mass, which is why you have you know, the, the wound strings, the low notes on a guitar or violin. You could change the tension. This is not, this again, not very easy to control. So sometimes there are some instruments where you sort of, you know, well, in a, in a guitar you can, you know, you can flex the neck to get a little bit of a vibrato, which is changing the tension of the strings. Or tuning it. Or tuning it, right, turning the little knob to get it tuned uh, in the beginning. Um, and then the analogy with the wind instruments is it's basically the same thing, but now we've got um, but the air column. Here's like the classic kind of oboe type instrument. What happens is you have a reed here, right? On, a, on an oboe, you have a little reed, which is basically a sealed end. But, it's, um, but occasionally the reed will open, and you can push in a little bit of air through your lips. And so it's like this gated energy input. And then what happens, you put a little burst of air in here, it travels down, it reflects off the end, comes back, actually, because it's an open tube, it gets a non-inverting reflection. So you have this little positive pressure burst that comes back. And then when it hits the reed, if you you're controlling the reed with your lips, so it's just on the edge of letting energy in, and that incoming pressure burst is enough to open up again. So you get another pressure burst coming in, and you get this sustained oscillation, because you're always injecting every cycle, you're injecting a little bit of energy to keep it, to keep it going. But the frequency itself is stably dependent on the length, and so if you don't let the air go all the way down to the end, you've got an open finger hole here, and you get a reflection here, and you get the oscillation from a shorter period. Yeah. Um, could you explain why there's a reflection even if there's no end cap on the tube? Yeah, that's, a great, that's a great question, right? So it's very obvious, it, it's very intuitive that if you have this rope, or this, you know, the rope is the first thing, but it goes down here, it hits the nut, and then it's like, well, it's got to, something's got to happen to it, and so it reflects back, and so it's not, it's not that much of a shock to see it reflecting back there. What's more surprising is that if you could actually build this rope, but rather than a fixed thing, it sort of had this smooth um, sliding junction that would allow you to maintain the tension, so it doesn't allow you to move this way, but allows it to move freely this way. Then actually you'd still get a reflection, but now the reflection is uh, non inverting Actually, you do see that. If you have a rope and you flick it, there's nothing at the end, and you get a little bit of reflection back, right? And that's the reflection due to the non, -in non the open end, as it were. It's like it's, uh, it's allowing allowing, it's, uh, so 
so now the only words I can use to describe it are impedance. Because that's now that's the best ne the next best analogy I've got is what I learned in you know undergraduate EM or wave uh, propagation waveguide stuff, which is that this idea that if, if you have this um, waveguide, this tube that has uniform properties, you're good. But if you change anything, then that's a that's a disruption, and you get impedance change, and you get reflections in both directions from that. So that's what happens. That that that's from the point of view of the propagating wave, an increase in impedance, which would be like a closed end, is as bad as a decrease in impedance, which would be like open space, because they're both step changes from impedance, and so they don't support the continuous propagation of energy, and some of it gets reflected back. Now, um, so are we still talking about like the uniform, like high pressure uh, air going through? Yeah, the tube at any one point. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. it doesn't seem intuitive that that would come. Yeah, let me just see if I can think. So, um, so the, the all these all these problems involve energy being transferred between two different places, right? So in the synchronic like oscillator, it's kinetic energy versus uh, potential energy in the spring. In the in the in the rope, it's actually the same. It's the the energy gets transferred between the displacement of the string, which is potential energy, and the in, in momentum of the string, the, the kinetic energy that's being moved. In this case, the two, you know, you can choose your your variables as you like, but there's a there's a pressure which is like how closely packed the, the gas is, and there's also a little bit of volume velocity that as the pulse moves along, it's, you know, it's like it's there's everyone's shifting a little bit to the left, and so there's some so you, you get the trans transmission between those two things. Normally, in the uniform tube, a little bit of volume velocity, like volume velocity pulse increases the density in the next part of the tube enough that the pressure goes up, and that provides enough force to cause the volume velocity. So when it goes out, it creates a negative pressure of the force. How does the air back in? That sounds great. Yeah, it does. So what happens at the end here is that he's got this pressure pulse coming along. You have pushes the last set of particles out, but now suddenly, instead of keeping the pressure, instead of making the pressure go up at the end, they sort of they immediately get lost <coughs> in this huge, you know, low impedance thing. And then somehow there's like a, yeah, there's a there's a, a, a recoil. Yeah, well, but it, yeah, it's uh, like a small vacuum. But yeah, it's absolutely. Yeah, exactly. I, I I don't know, you know, so we're, we're talking very very um, loosely, but it's something something worse happens. So then you get the, uh, the, the, the negative wave coming back. Just because there's some local displacement here, the physics isn't in, in, in equilibrium, so then again you have to do something with that. That's the best. Uh, do the red and blue waves. Um, so red and blue here are now not the two traveling waves, they're the volume velocity and the pressure. Thank you for pointing that out. And it's the, there are. This is, this is what you actually end up with a standing wave. So in theory, you've got these traveling waves, but they're equally balanced. So that you get these standing waves, um, and what you get is like this. If you could measure the, you know, the behavior of the gas along the tube, you'd find that there is this point here where the pressure has to be zero because it's, you know, venting to free space. You can't get, the, you can't increase the pressure here because there's too much gas to build up. But then there's this. Up here, the pressure is maximally varying, and it's like oscillating, oscillating around here. Now here, you've got again another node in pressure where the pressure is always zero, and then here, where we're inputting, is a non-zero point in, in pressure. But the volume velocity is complementary to that. So here, we've got maximum variation in pressure. We actually get no movement, but the net movement is zero. And here, where we have the zero in pressure, we have the largest movement of actual gas. And again, it's all just comes out of the of the uh, thinking of you know, elemental physics. There's no, there's nothing that you don't know about how to make this work. It's just putting down the little thinking about little blocks and the forces on them and what happens, and just working that math forward. But there are these interesting properties about um, well, what if you think about how much energy you have to put in here 
to get a certain amount of uh, certain amplitude of pressure variation. In theory, you can if you just drive this with some sinusoidal pressure input. There's nothing to stop you driving this at any frequency. But it turns out that if you drive it such that you've got an exact standing wave with an, you're driving it at a pressure node, so basically it really wants to keep the pressure at this point zero, so that if you put even a tiny bit of pressure in this, you're going to get a very large flame velocity. That's the resonance, and that's why you get the, the particular note that you, you want. But if you've ever played a wind instrument, you know that the, the fundamental, but then you can also get harmonics, multiples of that, or particular odd multiples of that, which correspond to sort of more, more cycles in here. Okay? So they're also stable resonant modes. The, the, the impedance as a function of frequency has these, um, has these sort of minima in it, which are places where for a little, a small amount of uh, pressure variation, you get a large volume velocity variation, something like that. I, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, I, I feel like you, you, you deserve a much better explanation of that, and it wouldn't take that long, although I'm not sure if I'm the best person to do it, but it just would, all I'm doing here is just giving you a little pointer toward what's going on and some, some, something that if you want to follow this up, you have an idea of where to look. What you look in an acoustics textbook, but basically what the uh, what the solution is going to feel like. If an idea. Okay, so that's so there is this kind of there's this you know large large set of problems which are about these propagations of waves which are solved by the wave equation and have these solutions which end up being these nice standing waves, sinus level. They have, they have a nice Fourier fit in that they're standing waves at each sinusoid and you have multiple different sinusoids and you can analyze them separately and superpose them like that. So that leads to the question of how we're going to, what we can do in terms of uh, simulations or maybe computer musical instruments. And so there's this very nice body of work which mostly came from um, this guy Julius Smith at Stanford where he takes the idea of these propagating waves in space and builds these digital simulations. That's basically what I was showing you in that little processing sketch. But the idea is you've got, you know, this is the classic kind of wind instrument thing where you have the energy coming from the nonlinear element, the reed, you've got this waveguide, you've got the scattering junction, which is basically the finger hole, and then maybe you've got some more waveguide and the load, which is the radiation to the natural radiated sound. Um, and then you know that if this is a, if the length of this delay is a quarter wavelength, then the whole loop is going to be a half wavelength, and then that's going to give you sort of the ability to have oscillator the way it looks, the particular frequency you want. And so we can simulate that um, with a set of delay lines, and we have this, you know, we can have separate delay lines for the positive and negative going traveling waves, just like I showed. And then we have reflections here, and it turns out you want these reflections to be, uh, if it, depending on whether you're modeling a string or a wind instrument, you want it to be minus one at the closed end, and then either minus one at the other end if it's also closed, or one if it's open. And there's some, there's some slight smoothing that goes on here to do with the loss. So the energy gets lost, and so the wave gets a little bit changed as it goes through here. But that's uh, you know, typically a small amount of loss, that's the thing we'll stop us then you can commute all these pieces together. If you just got this values going around this loop, you can put, stick the two delay lines together, you can stick the two coupling functions together, you just get this thing, which is a single delay line and a single um, loop mod modification filter, which is typically a low pass kind of filter. It's got, you're losing energy every time, and you lose energy in high frequency more rapidly, so it gives you a low pass effect. And this actually was a, uh, uh, so sort of independently developed as a nice way of generating musical, synthetic music instruments in the 60s by Carpenter and Strong, but they didn't really make the connection that it was an, an, an analogy to a traveling wave. They just said, oh, this, this sounds interesting, we can try it out. And so that gives us a simulation. Before, when I showed you this, um, this thing, we were running at... Um, 
it actually has a little parameter here, which is the F0. So we're running at one hertz. But if we make that a little um, higher, then we can actually hear the output. So here's the same thing, but um, now the F0 is 220 hertz. And also, I've sort of I've, I've, uh, grafted on my spectrogram so we can see a spectrogram in the background at the same time as we're listening to the sound. And again, uh, let's just fix that. I can find it. So it's the same thing, but now it's going to oscillate. Basically, I just made the delay lines much shorter, so it oscillates much more quickly. And so now if I pluck it, that's the kind of classic plucked string sound that sort of dies away. So there's a little bit of loss as, as it loops around more and more. The high frequencies get filled out, so we're almost left with this, this simple sin half of a sinusoid flipping up and down. It's still generated as the superposition of these two sinusoids traveling off the directions, but because they always cancel out at the end, you just get the sinusoid flipping up and down. Now, what we can hear is that depending on how we initialize it, we get a different amount of high frequency at the beginning, we get a different sound. So this is, you know, plucking a guitar string right in the middle. Not such an interesting sound. If you pluck it at one end, now the shape is much more, it's got a higher, higher slope in it we get more high frequency. And with this simulation, I also make it so you can have these kind of non-linear plucks in the middle. And you can get these uh, different amounts of uh, different qualities of sound coming from the different initial conditions. It's the same dynamics the whole time, but just depending on the initial conditions, the initial pluck shape, you can get different sounds coming out. And uh, I don't know if I don't know how convincing you sound that, but in you find that but in general, the, uh, the results are very uh, rem remarkably kind of realistic sounding, given that this is a very, very simple simulation, just a delay line with a single fixed filter, a few points of filter. It sort of begins to sound quite convincingly like a, um, a plug.